Good morning, and welcome to the Children's Mental Health Learning Series. The second year of the learning series will focus on mental health topics important to youth. 70% of mental health illnesses have their onset during childhood and adolescence. Individu individuals between the ages of 15 to 24 are more likely to experience mental illness or substance abuse than any other age group. Potential impacts of mental illness such as drug and alcohol addiction, homelessness, and involvement with the justice system impact on a young person's education, employment, and the ability to lead a full and productive life. Early identification and interve intervention are crucial. Uh, collectively, we can develop strategies to assess young people and provide services and support that are meaningful and relevant. Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services and, and Human Services are committed to working together to improve the lives of children uh, and youth with mental illness. This learning series provides free, helpful information and strategies for youth, their families, caregivers, and professionals who support youth with mental health issues. Topics in the first year included the importance of child caregiver relationships during the early years and the impact on the child's developing brain. We learned that hope and optimism are vital in the success of children and that healing is possible for traumatized parents and children. Other sessions explored such topics as bullying, ADHD, and social and emotional well-being. All past sessions are available on the Human Services website. Today, Dr. Frank McMaster will present Understanding the Adolescent Brain. Dr. McMaster is an expert in the area of neurobiology and pediatric and the adolescent mental health. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Pediatrics at the University of Calgary. He uses cutting edge brain imaging technology to understand the human brain and how it develops, what can go wrong in mental illness, and to develop new ideas on how to intervene. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Frank McMaster. I'm very excited to come down to Edmonton to give this uh, chat about understanding the teen brain and understanding what happens during brain development. So the big question to kind of start to frame our discussion is what is adolescence? Well, adolescence is really a special time of wonder and growth where teenagers grow up to become fully functioning adults. You know, they develop all their sense of self and all these important things. Uh, of course, that whole other flip side of, of the coin that happens. So what is the main job of adolescence? Really, it's to become a functioning uh, adult, to develop the cognitive capabilities, the abilities to delay gratification, the abilities to kind of get ready for the real world. These are the jokes, people. This is as good as it's going to get. But really, in all seriousness, that really is the job of adolescence, is to prepare you for moving on to become a fully functioning uh, adult, contributing member of society, and all that sort of good stuff. That's me in high school. Uh, when I showed this picture to my kids, they were horrified to see how much I, they looked like me. And I kept laughing evilly and saying, vision of your future. Uh, but I turned out all right. Uh, I'm a neurobiologist in psychiatry and pediatrics at the Alberta Children's Hospital. And I use brain imaging to really try to understand the teen brain. That, that, that's where I'm coming from, is trying to understand it from a biological point of view and how that uh, is reflected with behavior. So to acquaint you with my little world, uh, I'll start you with some brain basics so we're on the same page going forward. And you'll either walk away from this with a better understanding of the brain or really hating me for boring you. Uh, I'm socially awkward enough as a scientist to be okay with either way. And actually, speaking of awkward, I'm on a little pedestal, so if I fall off, feel free to laugh. It's probably going to happen. So here's your brain. Now, don't be too grossed out. You know, even my kids can handle this sort of thing. This is a picture from last Christmas at my house. <laughs> if you look closely, you can see where he chipped his tooth trying to bite it. It's a very Dexter Christmas. But really, when you look at the brain, the way to really think of it, though, it's the sum total of that person's hopes, dreams, memories, loves, losses, the works, everything uh, that, that's ever happened to them. When I was a teaching assistant in graduate school in neuroanatomy, uh, one of my friend's grandmothers passed away, and she donated her body and brain to the program. And in one of those Tupperware containers, 
was the brain of my friend's grandmother. I didn't know which one, but somewhere in that, because I'd met her a bunch of times, uh, you know, I was a coded memory in one of those brains that I was using to teach. Uh, but even more formative for me growing up, I had a friend who had a brain tumor. This is when I was in elementary school. And after the operation, he came back an entirely different kid. Very rash and impulsive, whereas uh, before he was just a sweet, regular kid. And that change in his brain really changed the course of his life. And then in my early 20s, a close friend lost his daughter to an inoperable brain tumor. And I was shocked to see how the brain was still largely beyond the reach of medicine. And that's something that for a very, very long time really stood true. And it's only now that we're really starting to crack that code and starting to be able to do things that were unimaginable not just 10 years ago, but even five years ago. And the same is true for, you know, uh, when you look at these kids and families suffering from neurological and psychiatric illnesses, trauma, these brain changes have ripples throughout their whole lives, changing their course. And you'll take away a bit of that when you start to see how the, the teen brain really develops. So there's a lot of mystique and excitement about the brain. Indeed, we had a decade of the brain not too long ago. You don't see many people clamoring for a decade of the pancreas. Uh, you know, you're not putting on a diabetes session anytime soon. I don't want to make anybody mad. Um, but really, you know, the, the, it's really held a lot of mystique for understanding things. Now, one of the myths I like to put away very early on is that you only use 10% of your brain. Uh, there's even that new movie that just came out that the whole premise was based on that. If you only use 10% of your brain, you wouldn't be sitting here. You'd be hooked up to machines helping you live. Uh, you know, you really try to use as much as, as, much as you have. Uh, I used to make a joke about 10% of the brains and Rough Riders fans, but I had to give that up. One of my best friends married a Rough Riders fan. But to understand the brain, you really need to know some of its parts. And the brain is composed of brain cells or neurons. And the longest neuron in your body is about a meter long, going from your spine to your toes. Most are very, very tiny and small. Uh, so then you have the glial cells, which is the other type of cell, and those are involved more along the lines of helping to clean up a lot of the activity that the, the neurons go through. They're kind of like a very elevated janitorial staff, but they also play a very big supportive productive role in making brain chemicals and neurotransmitters and things like that. So those are the two main parts that you need to think about. Now, if you want to know what a brain feels like in real life, take your finger, stick it inside some jello. Uh, that's about the consistency of your brain. I did a talk for uh, the Children's Hospital Foundation once for a coal company, and I made a brain jello mold just to show them what it looked like and if they wanted to feel it. Uh, nobody would touch it to eat it, except for this one guy who sat there just kind of hoeing into it the whole time. And everybody slowly moved away from him and just kind of left him to sit by himself. Now, neurons talk to each other using chemicals that cross the space between them. So they don't actually really touch. There's a space called the synapse where they actually send chemicals across to allow them to talk to each other. And that causes an electrical charge to fire. And that continues down to another part of the neuron and connects to another neuron and so on and so on. So when people talk about chemical imbalance, this is where that really comes from. You can think of it like a dinner party where nobody talks, and everybody communicates by throwing a drink in each other's faces, and then you taser yourself, and you throw a drink into somebody else's face. And if that metaphor doesn't work for you, we go to very different holiday parties. But really, when you break it down the way to think of it, this is the basic unit of you. You know, there are people who spend their lives uh, studying different parts of this synapse. You know, the potassium channels or a particular subunit of uh, the NMDA glutamate receptor. You know, they'll, they'll spend their careers, 30, 40 years, working on just tiny little things like that. Those people are boring. Um, but really, it, it's, it's, it's important to know that even at the most fundamental level, you know, this is how the brain can talk and work and do its job. So synapses are where the neurotransmitters act, the brain chemicals you've heard about. 
Now it's not like uh, when you think about depression, when they say, well, it's a chemical imbalance, you have low serotonin. Uh, it's not quite like your neurotransmitters are like a toner cartridge, uh, you know, where you just end up getting low and then you got to run to staples to pick up some more serotonin. Uh, it really is a bit more convoluted than that. They tend to work together socially in teams to activate and inhibit and depending on which part of the brain they're acting or who they're, what other neurochemicals they're working with can change their function. So it's a very complex picture of how neurotransmitters work. So kind of be wary when you hear those stories in the media saying, oh yeah, low GABA levels have a, this effect in whatever. Take it with a grain of salt. Now your brain cells uh, use about the equivalent of a flashlight when it comes to electricity wise. So you can actually call somebody a dim bulb. Uh, or if somebody's very, very different, you can say they're on European voltage. What is the speed of thought? How fast do those impulses travel uh, through, through the brain cells? The top speed that's been clocked is about the same as that of a Bugatti Veyron, which is about 267 miles per hour. So that's pretty peppy. You can think pretty fast. But you have to actually think as well that those thoughts are all, they're gatherings of large numbers of neurons working together to say something. Now all that effort takes resources. Uh, the brain uses about 20% of the oxygen that you take in, even though it's about 2% of your body weight on average. So really think about that, you know, how, how much that you have to pull. So when you're out of breath from going on a hike or doing the stairs at work or something like that, say, hey brain, don't be so greedy. Let everybody else have some oxygen for once. Use about a liter of blood per minute, and that's how strokes can actually cause so much damage because you accumulate so much blood so quickly. So your brain really is an energy hog. And so when you think developmentally for growing brains, what that implication is going to be. It's not just eating right to try to grow their bodies, but also to help grow their brains. Now the brain uses glucose or sugar to support those electrochemical reactions. Uh, about four grams of glucose per hour, about the equivalent of what's in a sugar packet. Now, please don't go out and eat sugar packets for lunch. Uh, your reward system would love you, but your body probably would not like it after a little while. Now, brain regions act together in circuits. And this is one of the key things to take away from this, is that, you know, they, they, they act together. Now, this is a basic wiring diagram of the electronics for a 1956 Chevy. So you can see fairly complex. This is the classic uh, brain circuit diagram of the macaque monkey. And that took decades of research to try to map out. And that's, you know, for, for, for a primate at a different order of complexity compared to uh, humans. You know, I wouldn't do monkey work. I don't think I could handle them throwing poo at me all day. but. Really, when you think about it, you know, that how the, the complexity of even simple uh, brain systems is, you know, is very apparent. So no one part of the brain really works alone. And that's an important thing to remember. There's no single part of your brain that makes you love chocolate, cheer for a particular sports team, uh, you know, get scared watching The Walking Dead, all those sorts of things. There's no one part of the brain that really handles that. They tend to work together, each brain region, with other regions to get the job done. So the brain is a complex structure, heavy on interaction and teamwork. And of course, your team is only as strong as your weakest link. And when it's one of the core structures, you can get a lot of problems. Now, brain cells are like every other cell. They die. You are losing brain cells right now, and it's not all my fault. You lose one about every second, so there goes another one, another one, another one, another one. But don't worry, uh, you have over 100 billion brain cells, about equal to the number of stars in the galaxy, and there's even developing evidence that you can actually grow new ones. And I remember when the first papers came out talking about brain plasticity, you've probably heard that term before. Uh, even seen the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, uh, or the nature of things show on it. For a long time, people would talk about, oh, you're hardwired, that you reach a mature brain and that's it. You're locked in. 
Uh, not so much. Your brain's actually pretty plastic. If it wasn't plastic and changeable, how would you learn anything new? It's not like you turn 18 and all of a sudden, that's it. I've learned everything I can learn. I'm done. Thank you very much. Uh, no. So the brain can still change quite a bit. But I will say, I, I remember when I was at journal club in graduate school, you know, some of the older professors thinking that you know, this new science that was coming out about plasticity was just you know, BS and malarkey. Uh, but really, it's, it's an important part of, of, of development. Now, even cooler, when you think about the number of brain cells that you have, each of those brain cells has so many synapses and connections as well. So in each millimeter of cortex, you've got millions upon millions upon millions of little connections. So you really got to think of just how complex a structure this is. Now, as a total weird fact and aside you can take and amaze your friends with, uh, in the human uh, digestive system, you actually have the same number of neurons that are in a cat's brain. So it's about roughly equivalent. So amaze your friends with that fact. Uh, or when you're hungry, you go, ah, time to feed the cat. Uh, either way. So how can we study the living brain? And this has been one of the big things that held off a lot of work was, well, how do you get at it? The only time you really saw a brain was you know, under conditions of they were trying to do neurosurgery to take out something that didn't belong, tumors, things like that, uh, w repair war injuries, traffic accidents. That's the only time they really saw a living human brain. It was very difficult to get at. But the advent of some new technologies really changed how we can study the brain. You know, brain imaging really allows uh, for us to really look inside in a non-invasive way. That's one of my boys going into the magnet at the children's hospital. All I can see when I watch this video is his socks, because they're really dirty. He was running around the hospital before we filmed this in his bare feet, and it was in, uh, in the sock feet, and it was February, and his that's all I can see. But anyways, that's the MRI. Um, as a parent, that really bothers me. Uh, but that's the MRI, the magnetic resonance imaging device. And what it allows for is for us to look inside the living human, living human brain in a way that's really tolerable, that is very easy to do when it's done in a proper you know, research circumstance and it's nice and easy on the kids. Um, it's very safe. Uh, you know, non-invasive, all that sort of good stuff. Uh, the only people who have the most questions about it actually uh, tend to be the healthy teenage boys will ask questions along the lines of, well, can you read my mind? And we always say, thankfully, no. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have a whole lot of brain scan images of Scarlett Johansson or Megan Fox or whoever. And who knows what else. But brain imaging is obviously a very hot area of research, and there's all these new studies that come out in the media that talk about uh, things that are happening. And we can look at a number of different things. I always show this slide when I talk to uh, medical residents and things like that in the hospital, and they always ask me, oh, where do I get that book? And I always point to the author's name. I said, do you really think there's a guy named Ray D. Ologist? Now we can look at the brain with very high levels of detail, uh, you know, down to the millimeter and below, in time frames that the kids don't mind. We can really move it along. And we can look at the, the thickness of the cortex, the volume, the shape of different brain structures. So we can really get in there and look structurally, how does the brain work? We can look at brain function during different tasks. You know, that is uh, somebody actually just doing something simple like this, tapping their fingers. So the motor cortex for the hand becomes activated in the brain. And we can track that. That's a very simple task. We can do very complex things. We can have people look at different scenes and look for different emotional reactions, uh, different cognitive reactions, inhibition, all sorts of fascinating things that we can do with functional imaging. We can look at brain chemistry as well. We can get spectrographs like that squiggly line that you can see there. Uh, if I ever scan any of your brains and do a spectra on them, you want to see a nice, really high peak like that. That's a great marker of brain cell health. Uh, in conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's disease, that's actually really low. So we can look at all sorts of different things with brain chemistry. We can look at how those different brain regions talk to each other to work in the circuits, the connections that they make through white matter. So those are all like the different cables, if you will, connecting different parts of the brain to each other. 
allowing parts over here to talk to parts over here, and all that sort of good stuff. So the common questions we get about MRI, you know, does it hurt? No. You might get a little bored. Uh, can it read my mind? Uh, does anything touch or poke me? No. Do I get any needles traditionally for research studies? No. Uh, can I sleep? Unless we're doing a functional task, it's a great place to sleep. Nobody can bother you. Uh, when my oldest boy was born, I volunteered for every study that went on because I could grab like an hour of sleep in the magnet. And then I'd come home and I'd be rested. It'd be great. Uh, is it radiation? No. It's a non-ionizing radiation, so you can get scanned again and again and again and again. It's not like an x-ray or anything like that. Uh, will I stick to the car fridge afterwards? That came out of a bad joke. Uh, we told somebody that, you know, you're in the, the, the magnet for an hour, so you're magnetized, so you've got to stay away from big metal objects. And right after we said that, she asked the question of, well, how do I get home? And just as soon as she asked that question, you could see a click in her mind that we were pulling her leg, and she was a little mad. Who says scientists don't have a sense of humor? Um, no real reason to show you that. <laughs> now, for research, a quick word about it. You know, it's not all mad scientists that are out there. Everyone who gets involved in research it has a lot of rights and protections that come along with it. And especially if you're involved in research studies that are going through university and are connected with Alberta Health Services. Uh, or your own provincial medical system, depending on where you are. Uh, you know, they have all sorts of safeguards, things that are there to provide scientific and ethical reviews to really make sure that you are protected a, as a person. And most critically, without research, we really would have nothing. Uh, this sign hangs by the elevators uh, near my office, and it's a nice reminder that every cure really does begin with research. And I put my money where my mouth is. My kids volunteer for all sorts of different studies that go on. Uh, one of my kids, I think it's his goal to go through every machine in the hospital. Um, but we always talk to each other about why they do it, too. You know, who, who are they helping? What are they helping us to learn? What are they helping to do? So we lose brain cells, as I talked about. How does that fit in with development of the brain, especially in the teenage years? Now, one concept that I always talk about is the expectation people have around brain development. Uh, it's not like height and weight. You know, it, you don't start off with a little baby that turns into the toddler that grows bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Your brain does not follow a very clear-cut, linear relationship where it just gets bigger over time. Indeed, it doesn't even follow a, 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 a line where it goes and gets more complex over time. If anything, it gets more complex, then starts to get a little less complex, but more functional, as you'll see. And this is a slide from uh, Jay Geed's work at the National Institutes of Mental Health. And for normal brain development, uh, he really is a, a, great, a great place to start. But if you really look at the slide, you can see before birth, the first half of that bottom graph, there's a lot going on. There's brain cells being born. There's synapses, those little spaces between the cells being created. Uh, you know, you've got migration of cells going from one part of the brain to the other. You get all this great activity going on before you were born. And for a long time, people thought, oh, that's the heart. That's the meat. That's where all the good stuff is happening. And if bad things happen then, pfft, game over. But what we've learned is that from birth, there's a whole lot of other things that happen afterwards. And that's where a lot of the teen brain development really becomes a very important thing. You know, you can think of before birth and the early years as kind of you're building the foundation of the house. Actually, you're digging the hole for the foundation of the house, I really should say, and preparing to really build up towards the adult brain. And brain cell loss is really critical for proper brain development. You actually want to lose brain cells as a teenager, and you want them to lose brain cells because you're pruning out the connections that they are not using and that they aren't going to use, that aren't functional. You're getting rid of the chaff and kind of leaving the wheat behind, unless you're gluten intolerant and then I don't know what you're doing. Um, but you can see these different graphs, there's no pop quiz at the end, don't worry. Uh, you know, it's time on the bottom and it's different measures uh, on the side going up and down. Things like uh, volume, glucose metabolism in the middle, synaptic density, how many synapses do you have in different parts uh, of the brain. And you can see it's not a linear relationship going up. 
It's not like height and weight. You can see it's actually going down. With a peak that can happen between meh, 9 and 11 years of age, depending on if you're a boy or a girl. So you actually, if you know a 10-year-old uh, or a 9-year-old girl, if you know a 10-year-old boy, 9-year-old girl, they have more brain cell connections in their brains than we do as adults. And they get awfully smug when you tell them that. They think it's quite cool. They're like, well, I'm smarter than you? It's like, mm, not, not really. But you have the potential. And that's the important part. So the way to think of it, it's a very complex story about how different parts of the brain are really maturing at different rates. And there's some parts that come all online very quickly and some that come online much later. And that timing is very, very important. So those growth curves really should tell you that it's a very complex story and that when you're looking at the teen brain, you're really on shifting sands is the way to really think of it. It's a moving target. It's not a static entity by any stretch of the imagination. You know, if you look at birth, these are brain cells stained from, from different slices. So at birth, you know, there's only not that many. You start to really have an explosion of neurogenesis, an explosion of brain connections all through early childhood right up to puberty where you really start to get packed in. And then when you start to hit the teenage years, you start to prune those out. You start to get rid of those connections. You lose those neurons, synapses, dendrites, all those little parts of the brain cells that, that don't matter. Now, this is a big complication. This is John March, a friend of mine from Duke University, uh, who really helped establish uh, cognitive behavioral therapy treatment for pediatric obsessive compulsive disorder, if you ever wonder who he is. Uh, a really nice guy, and a very, very smart guy. And he said this about brain development, and it, it's very apt. You know, It's bad for the brain to be mentally ill. The brain grows by learning. If you're mentally ill, what your brain learns is mental illness. Now, for mental illness, that's a very apt quote, but really for development as a whole, when you start to really apply it, you can see that well, if your brain grows by learning, what you're exposing it to, what you're feeding it, stimuli-wise, life event-wise, is shaping how it's going to, what's it going to turn into. So this is a very complex slide, but it's actually one of the more important ones. Uh, this is a brain. Uh, and it, what it's going to show is this is the brains of twins, uh, identical twins, so same DNA. So same DNA, you think, well, it should be the same brain. And what the change in color that you're going to see is going to occur over ages 5 to 18. And it's going to happen rather fast because the guys who made this are weird and they like things to move quickly. I don't know. They didn't think they'd make it go slow. They made it go out awfully fast. And the change to red is the ch it indicates a difference between the twins, the twin pairs. So these are people whose brains should look the same. Their DNA looks the same. Their brain should look the same. So over the, between the ages of 5 to 18, you can see actually their individual experiences. I'll play it again. Ah, I'll try to play it again. end up changing their brains quite a bit. So they end up differing quite a lot over time. You know, and that's the way to think of it too, is that your environment, even if you're a twin with the same DNA, the same genetic code, the same blueprint, living in the same environment, these aren't separated at birth. Uh, you know, one sent to live on a deserted island, one sent to live in a luxury penthouse in Manhattan or something like that. These are twins raised together who should be the same whose brains end up looking quite different as they grow up. And that's their personal environment changing it. So your brain really is the only one like it that's out there. Now, these changes happen with uh, other things as well. This is the, the brains of people who have had extensive music lessons through childhood and adolescence. And these are the changes in their brains as a result of music lessons compared to uh, healthy people. So this is something that teachers really use all their careers. They're building brains. That's their job. 
it should be teacher brain builder, uh, you know, or music teacher brain builder too. Um, I used to make a joke that you know you, you'd be able to do this if you could find you, with regular education to compare people who had no education versus people who had uh, a regular education. You could compare those two groups, but it's really hard to find people who've never went to school. And I used to make a joke about Rob Ford there, but I had to stop because that would be bad taste now. Um, please, no angry emails. The, but really, that's what teachers do. They're shaping those brains over time. And that's what parents do. That's what their peer group does, is you're actually changing how their brains function. Now, the timing of brain development has changed quite a bit as well, and uh, based on what we've been finding with the brain science. When do those pruning, that elimination of brain cells, how long does that go on? Uh, you know, when does it finally stop? You know, for the longest time, people thought, oh, yeah, birth to about uh, 11, 12, then you hit puberty, then 18, you're an adult. Congratulations. Go vote. Go fight in the army. All that sort of good stuff. You're done. And then you're an adult, and then you eventually die. Um, with brain science, though, a lot of that competitive elimination that happens, especially in the front part of the brain, as you're going to see, really extends deep into your mid-20s. Uh, it goes on for quite a while. So you think, by the time you're 25, your brain's still developing. You know, you're thinking about, you know, uh, done, you'd be finished up university, you'd be, you know, uh, or if you started working after high school, you'd have been in the, the field for a long time working, all sorts of different things. And there's even a few smaller parts of the brain that don't actually finish up till your early 30s. You know, so brain development goes on for quite a long time. And when brain scientists talk about adolescence, they actually say, typically now till at least age 25 is their study group that they're looking at. Because the brain changes are still that dynamic over that time frame. Now, there is a part of the brain near the memory center, uh, near the hippocampus, that doesn't really finish till you're in your early 60s. Uh, but just because it's near the memory center, don't use that as an excuse like to forget an anniversary or a birthday. Uh, it does not work. Say, oh, I, that part of my brain's still immature. I forgot. No, does not help. Now, when it comes to teens, there are two really core parts, maybe three, uh, in development that really shape their experience. First, that those circuits that I spoke of they really need to be coordinated. You know, if you've got a team, you gotta have a coach. If you've got a classroom, you gotta have a teacher. If you've got, uh, you know, uh, uh, a parliament, you have to have a prime minister. Although hopefully your brain works better than the government does. Um, but really those circuits really need to be coordinated and work together. And this front part, so please always wear a bike helmet, because uh, this is the part that always gets hit. This front part of your head is called the frontal executive, or the prefrontal cortex is another term that you'll hear. And it's a part of the brain that really helps coordinate everything else. Uh, plays a big role in working memory, for your ability to remember things while you're working on them. Uh, paying attention, uh, inhibition, uh, to stop yourself from doing something stupid. Uh, planning things out, thinking things through, uh, being flexible or set shifting, ability to move from one thing to another without you know, getting too broken up about it. Basically, everything that makes you a viable adult, a good partner to somebody, a good employee, uh, is mediated by this chunk of land in the front of your head. And you know, this is the part that teachers and parents spend their lives working on. Uh, you know, and when I listed the functions, you know, if you had to describe some of the worst characteristics of teenagers, you know, forgetful, working memory, Attention, yeah, how many times have we seen that glazed over look in their eyes? Uh, inhibition, stopping yourself from doing something stupid. Uh, planning for the future, not exactly their strong suit. Uh, flexibility, being able to move from one thing to another, again, not exactly their strong suit. So you can really see where these functions really tap in. And this is one of the last parts of your brain to develop. So that last part, that boss of the brain, if you will, that's one of the terms that you'll hear a lot, uh, really is the last one to finish its development. That little part that I said that doesn't finish till you're in your mid-30s, 
right there on either side. And it's one of the higher order parts of your brain. And that's one of the key parts. And it doesn't finish up till that late. So it's also the part of your brain, though, when you think about it, if it takes that long, if you're into your mid-20s before the good parts are done, you know, if it takes that long to get there, that's the most time you can be shaped by your environment. And that can really feed into how that brain ends up growing. So when I showed you that slide about the twins and how their brains changed a lot over time, the red was all up front. And that's because that's the last part to really finish up. So it's the most malleable, the most plastic. So if it's still developing, it's not in command. What happens when it's not in command? Somebody's got to be in charge. Somebody has to take over. It's these two guys. You can almost think of them like if you have a teenage son or daughter, they're, and they have they're kind of their two worst influence friends. It's these two. Basically, they work on two areas of brain function. Nucleus accumbens plays a big role in reward. Is this fun? Is this great? This is awesome. Nucleus accumbens. Amygdala, arousal and emotional processing. So taking those positive emotions that you get when you do something, putting them in, connecting them with that situation so you remember, I want to do that again, that was fun, that kind of stuff. So they're the, they're, they're the two worst influences, is the way to think of it. So if you want to see how, how primitive this is, you know, you think about the front part of your brain, it's huge. Hold up your thumb and look at your thumbnail. Your nucleus accumbens is about the size of your thumbnail. And that helps mediate pleasure in your brain. And that little tiny part is the thing that's responsible for a lot of the bad decisions that teenagers tend to make. Because without their prefrontal cortex to be in charge to say, don't do that, or that's not a good idea, this part says, this is fantastic. I want to do this all over again. This is awesome. And so this tiny, more primitive, but early developing part of the brain, so it's on the scene first. It's fully developed, ready to go. Whereas your prefrontal cortex, the boss, hasn't quite showed up yet. He's only, uh, only partially there to take over. Now, in case you're wondering what, what those pictures are, that uh, on the, well, if you're looking at it from a screen point of view, on the right side with the green, uh, that's an alcoholic looking at alcohol-related stimuli. And that's their nucleus accumbens becoming extremely active looking at the alcohol-related stimuli, going, this is great, I want that, that sort of an effect. And in the blue beside it, that's actually young kids between 7 and 11 years of age looking at food advertising targeted towards kids. And it's a very similar kind of effect on their nucleus accumbens of, this is great, I really want that cereal. I was going to say a brand name, but <laughs> yeah, that type of cereal that's out there with, that's great. No. Um, you know, that, that's my favorite, but the, that little part plays a very powerful role. And not just in some of our eating behaviors, uh, sexual behaviors, work behaviors, but also can end up turning into a big target for addictions later on. Uh, you know, you think about if you started substance abuse young before your prefrontal boss is on the scene, you could really train that guy up, the nucleus accumbens, to be, I love alcohol, this is great, and keep moving with that forward and, and, and kind of establish that. Now the amygdala, it's about the size of an almond. You'll be eating almonds later going, oh, cool. Um, and that's what processes a lot of those emotional reactions and helps link them to your memory system. Is it good, is it bad? Uh, is it exciting? Is it calming? All that sort of stuff. It helps process that, that too. Again, more primitive part, more early developing compared to the boss part of the brain. So those two guys are on the scene early and they can cause a lot of trouble. Most people think of these things, well, it's, it's a balance. It's like a scale and you can weight them on either side. Uh, you know, you don't want to be ruled by pleasure where that's all you think about, but you also don't want to be, you know, totally executive function, devoid of all emotion, like 
Mr. Spock or Sheldon on Big Bang or whatever. You want to have kind of a balance. And the scale metaphor, I, I, it, it doesn't really work for me. I tend to think of it more as a teeter-totter. You know, do you remember playing on the teeter-totter when you were little? And what would happen when that guy would sit on the other end of the teeter-totter? Well, that's reward, and that's the other end of the teeter-totter in the team brain. You know, he's shifted the balance to everything that's wonderful and exciting and awesome. This is where I want to be. This is the coolest stuff ever. And that's really pushing everything towards it. So you can think of it kind of like the scales are very much tipped in that favor. So anytime a teenager does something that's actually pretty responsible, that delays gratification, praise it. That's a big deal. That's them showing they are moving beyond from what you know, the typical emotional reactions would be. You know, um, yeah, maybe another metaphor might be, you know, you can almost think of it as the prefrontal cortex of the parents. And if they're not home, you end up having a house party. That kind of effect might work too. Either metaphor. You know, you know the Nike slogan though? Just do it. Well, for teenagers, it's more of do it and do it, do it. They get that message a lot coming in their brains because the reward systems are so high tuned. And that's where these risk taking behaviors come from because they get a lot out of it. They're not thinking about the consequences. They haven't, their brains haven't developed to the point to take A and put it with B and go, oh yeah, swinging from that rope over that cliff, probably not a good idea. I could crash and die. You know, they don't, they, don't, they, don't, they don't do that planning for the future, thinking things through the way that we would hope they would do. So there's really good and bad, or two sides to the coin. You know, the same thing that makes them do the really dumb things that can scare the heck out of you as a parent uh, or as a teacher are also the same things that help them take those good risks. You know, to take that class that might be a bit of a stretch for them, that physics class or something like that, that they might think was too hard. Or the thing that makes them ask, you know, uh, the Winter Carnival Queen to the formal dance when, you know, probably not a great idea. Uh, you know, th th those sorts of risk-taking behaviors, though, that's the good side. You know, where they take those stretch things. They try to move a little bit further past where they were. And it's, but it's also the flip side, the negative side, the bad choices. You know, the decision to abuse, you know, drugs, alcohol, risky sex, put yourself in all sorts of physical danger. I mean, there's whole TV shows now that are basically, or YouTube videos uh, that are young people hurting themselves and people laughing about it. And those, that urge to take that physical risk comes from the fact that Every time I watch them, all I can think of is, yeah, that prefrontal cortex has got a ways to go as they sit there cradling themselves, crying after the skateboard accident. Um, but you can also think of it from the good and the bad from the plasticity point of view as well. You know, the good being the fact that their brains are so changeable, this is your chance to really help them grow, learn, become fully functioning, all that sort of wonderful stuff. You know, and the bad side, of course, being that, well, if they aren't being exposed to the good and pushing their brains in the proper way, and they're just picking up all those bad habits, then, you know, they can end up actually growing their brain, just like John March said, towards the bad side of the tracks, if you will. You know, substance abuse, all that sort of stuff. So the team. The brain circuits involved really need a leader. And that would be the prefrontal cortex uh, to become an adult. You know, you, you, you know, so what can you do as parents, people in society? How can you help put, this, uh, you know, put these kids on the straight and narrow path, if you want it to be my dad? Uh, if you want to push these kids on a proper path, you know, how can you put the I in team, if you will? And I always like that. See? The I in team, it's right there. Uh, and that's the prefrontal cortex. So what can we do? What are the strategies that we can employ to really kind of help uh, healthier development? It's a bit of a balance, again. Structure and supervision are important, but it's important not to go too far with it. 
You know, you want to provide opportunities for young people to kind of grow against. Kind of the, you know, the, you know when a clam gets some dirt inside, or it tends to, uh, uh, it tends to aggravate it in the point that it forms a pearl around it, and that's how you end up with really nice pearls. Uh, the kids, teenagers, really need something to rub up against, something to develop against, to be challenged by. An unchallenged teenager is a dangerous thing. And they need those growth opportunities. And if they're structured ones, those are really great. Chances to build up their frontal executive, to start to put into play those planning behaviors, thinking about consequences, all that sort of stuff. You know, it doesn't take that long if you're a kid working at a fast food joint uh, to learn if you show up late a few times, you'll get in trouble. I shouldn't show up late. And to start to learn to, okay, I got to plan ahead, make sure I make it there on time. You start to learn these things. And you start to exercise that, that part of your brain a little bit more. You know, sports, clubs, volunteer work is actually a wonderful thing to do. It actually teaches them a lot about uh, uh, volunteering for the community and developing the community connection to others, that empathy that these days can be a little bit lacking. Employment is wonderful. I'm a big fan of people getting jobs early. Uh, I got a job early and I loved it. Uh, prison, that's a joke, but believe it or not, that's where a lot of kids get structure these days, is through the juvenile justice system. Uh, Stan Kucher, a good friend of mine from Dalhousie, always makes the comment that, you know, if you're wondering where the kids are, the kids who need help and the, 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 the kids who, you know, uh, are the most at risk, they're in two places. They're in school or juvenile justice. Either or. They're in those two systems is where you look for them. Uh, but really, you know, they need some sort of structure to kind of come up against, to grow against, to be challenged by, to kind of work through. Now, it can go too far. Nobody wants to see the helicopter parent. Uh, the helicopter parent is the, the classic parent that does everything for the child. In that situation, you're really stunting the prefrontal cortex. You're doing too much. You're preventing them from being challenged. You're preventing them from figuring it out on their own. And while this one's a joke meme from the internet, believe it or not, I had a parent come with their child to a job interview. And I was floored. Like, her and her son just both walked into the office, and I was so stunned, I was just like, OK. I'd ask him a question looking right at him. She would answer. So I kept looking at him, kept asking him questions, and she kept answering. And it ended up being kind of fun for me, because I got a weird sense of humor. But <laughs> kid didn't get the job. But uh, you know, it, it, he should have had that opportunity to be challenged, to be asked questions, to think on his feet, to talk it through, represent himself, what he wants to do. You know, it's not, not like he was going to hammer him with, you know really difficult calculus questions or anything like that. It was just standard job interview stuff. Where do you see yourself in five years? You know, not exactly a big deal. Uh, but really, and that's something that happens quite a bit. And it's been a big sea change that, that I've seen where parents are way, 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 way more involved. And you gotta think, well, in some ways it is productive and helpful, but in other ways you're not helping that prefrontal cortex develop. You're not letting that grain of dirt aggravate the clam till it makes the pearl. You know, you really want to see, see that happen. Now on the flip side, you can also even go the other way uh, about you know, kind of preventing them from any and all failures, uh, absolving them. Uh, this example, you saved my child from drowning. That's impossible. My child is a perfect swimmer. There must be something wrong with your pool. Uh, there is actually a lot of that as well. Kids need to fail. They have to fail. You don't grow if you don't fail. You learn way more from failure, especially as a teenager, when you can do it repeatedly and often, <laughs> and it's safe, and frankly, while it may seem a big consequence at the time, by the time you're 30, it doesn't really matter <laughs> you know, what happened. You, know, you can move beyond it. So you, you, have to, you can't bubble wrap them too much. Again, they need to be able to come up against it, learn how to deal with it. You know, learn how to not get the job, and what can I do better? Not take your mom to the interview, but you know what can you do differently to kind of grow beyond it? These are the things that they need to be challenged by to help them grow beyond where they were. Now, 
when you start to hit that and you start talking about challenges and failures, a lot of people go, stress. Stress is bad. Stress is going to kill my kid. It's going to mess up their brain. It's going to be horrible. There's actually really, when you think about it, three kinds of stress to really consider. And the way to kind of frame what they're going through is to look at it through that lens. You've got the positive stress. These are the everyday growing up things that happen to you that you have to go through, getting your driver's license, getting through the calculus final, uh, all that sort of stuff. These are the, the stressors that come against you that are controllable, short-lived, predictable. You know they're coming. You know when the calculus final is. It's not like you wake up one morning and, hey, calculus final, um, unless your teacher's really evil. Now, a, a young person's life is full of those little stresses. And those are really important for growing resilience. Think of resilience like a muscle. And I think Kelly Schwartz is going to be talking about resilience later. He's great um, later in the series. And building up that resilience with the small things help make the bigger things easier to handle. So you've got to take advantage of those bits. And you know, the, I always think back to when one of my kids was learning how to ride a bike. He really didn't want to hear from us, his parents. He didn't want our help at all. He went to his older friend, and by older I mean like a couple of months, and his friend taught him how to ride his bike. They went up and down the street for days until he finally got it. But he was stressed about it, he was challenged by it, but it was controllable, short-lived, and he did it. Now, what you call those relationships, the things that help you get through them, are the stable and supportive relationships. This is the helicopter parent before it takes off. When they're still on the ground and they, they haven't gotten total freak out, you're more of a supportive, you know, stable relationship to help you get through those and adapt to those adverse events. Now, tolerable stress is the next level up. Now, these are things that the, in, the inevitable parts of life, beloved family pet passes away, family member passes away, uh, a big move from one city to another, all these different things that can happen that are inevitable, bad things happen, it's part of life, uh, that are a little bit less controllable, a uh, little bit less predictable than positive stress. Those can really affect a child, but what can make them tolerable are those stable and supportive relationships and the experiences they had with positive stress to build up that resilience, to be able to cope through it and to work through it. Now, toxic stress is the far end. And that's when things are totally uncontrollable, unpredictable, all-encompassing, major neglect, major disease, all those sorts of like really, really bad life and death hardcore things that can happen. Uh, you know. Now, some things can be for some people tolerable, but for other people toxic. There's no strict definition. There's no, you don't get a card in the mail when the bad thing happens that says, congratulations, your stress is tolerable. There's nothing like that. It really is a personal perspective kind of thing. There's some things that you might just breeze through and think, I'm okay, I'll, I'll make it through. This is good. I'll be okay. That other people would decompress over and vice versa. But that's part of your own experiences and how you've been raised to kind of think about those things. You know, and, but what is some of the best buffers for uh, handling these sorts of things? Talk. Now, usually when I say talk more with teenagers, this is the expression that I get from people. Uh, it's most parents are afraid to do it. It's not comfortable. But it really is one of the biggest buffers that's out there. Does it have to be a parent? No. It can be a teacher, it can be if the, the family is a religious family, it can be a pastor. There's all sorts of different role models that somebody can turn to to help guide them through stressful periods. You know, when you think back to your own lives growing up, the different people that influenced you, you know, that were supportive and you know, helped you get through different things, the same kind of thing with this. They need someone to talk to, that stable and supportive relationship. Someone who let them vent, talk it through, and make sure they know that it's okay. Now, everybody listens to advice like that, right? You know, when you tell people to do something that's blindingly obvious, uh, that works every time. 
Uh, not really. In case you can't see that, it says, you know, so you will diet and exercise like the doctor asked? Nope. Uh, you know, diet and exercise are one of the big cures for just about, or big <laughs> mitigating things that can happen for just about every disease state. Almost nobody does it. Uh, telling people to talk to their teenagers is one of the biggest buffers. Almost nobody does it because it's hard. It's uncomfortable. You have to say stuff and sometimes sit there and not get anything back, like you're talking to an oak tree or something. But you got to put it out there. And you can't really turn it into a preaching session where you're talking at them. Uh, they're much like Superman with bullets. Uh, when they're being preached at, they'll just bounce off. Uh, you got to do that give and take, or some people like to call it that kind of serve and return of relationships of, you know, you hit the ball to them, they hit the ball back to you. You have to build that up. You know, um, tennis metaphor, I don't know. But you, know, you have to have it go back and forth. You have to allow them to say stuff too. And yeah, sometimes when they do something particularly daft, there really isn't a justification. So standing there demanding one probably isn't going to help much. The big thing is, well, what do you do to turn into a learning experience so they don't do it again? You know, they don't think that car surfing is a good idea to try another time. That sort of stuff. Not that I would ever car surf. You know, you need that constant, unrelenting sense, you know, that the kid knows that you're there for them, that they can tell you anything, and you know, even if nothing's troubling you, they can say, I'm cool, I'm good, everything's fine. Um, although there's a big difference between I'm fine and fine. Uh, you have to listen for that one. Um, it's easier for you to support them if they know that they can reach out to you. And this is one of the big flips that's kind of happened from, from a parenting perspective. It used to be, well, you have to get in and punish right away. And yes, discipline is an important part of parenting, but the also the big thing is the learning experience. What can you teach them to do differently? How do you tie that in? You know, you don't want them to walk away remembering just the discipline. You want them walking away thinking, okay, wow, that was stupid. I shouldn't have done that. I'm not saying don't punish them. Do what you think you need to do, but uh, within reason and the law. But the, you know, you, you really want to have them be able to learn from the experience. Now, when people start to think about problems that kids can have, you know, I, when I tell people I study, you know, depression in teenagers, I get the comment all the time, well, aren't all teenagers depressed? And it's like, no, about 10%, 15%, depending on, on which statistics you're looking at. It's actually not as common as you would think. Most kids are feeling fine. They're doing all right. You've got some that get stressed from time to time. You've got some that actually get distressed because life is really hard sometimes for some people. And that could be a passing phase. And then you have the kids at the top, the rarer kids, who are in really mental health trouble. And they need a lot of help and support. You, know, you can really think of it like a pyramid with most people kind of at the bottom doing all right with little dips into the stressed and distressed now and then. You know, not all teens are depressed, but some are, and they need help. And starting to separate that is a very important part. And I'll be talking a lot more about mental illness uh, for the talk in Calgary in this series uh, next month, I think it is, you know, coming up. So you can kind of think of it like that. And I got this pyramid idea from actually Stan Kutcher, a really bright guy on teen mental health uh, that's out there. And it really helps you conceptualize how rare some of these problems are and how common some of the other things are. Stress is common. Stress happens. Teaching people how to deal with it is a big thing. And I always like to kind of close on this quote from Frederick Douglass. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. And that really is a great line. You know, when you think about what's going on developmentally in a young person's life, from birth till they get out of the house, if you're lucky, um, you know, if you think about what happens, it's easier to get that right than it is to try to fix every possible thing that can go wrong afterwards. You know, prevention uh, is a very important part and helping people to thrive and learn how to deal with life and cope with life and move through life is, is a big part and that's one of the essential foundations that happens during those teen years. And if you've got a bad foundation, 
Everything else that's built on top of it isn't going to last very long. That's ac actually a house that was on my drive between the hospital and the clinic when I worked in Detroit City. It was this really beautiful old home that the foundation went and then the rest of the house collapsed in on itself. And you can think of that as kind of a nice metaphor for development. You get a strong foundation, adulthood's going to throw some stuff at you. The stronger the foundation is, the better off you'll be. So these are some of the people that tend to that, that, uh, help out with the work. It's quite a mix of folks from uh, not just University of Calgary, Alberta Health Services, but also Wayne State uh, in Michigan, Dalhousie University in uh, Nova Scotia as well. Uh, it takes a lot of people to do the work that I do, and it also takes a tremendous amount of community support uh, to make the work that I do happen. Whenever I show this slide, I always feel a bit like NASCAR, that I should get like a jacket with all the labels on it. I should get STP to fund me for some reason. I don't know how, but just because that's the only one I remember as a kid. But really, thank you. And if you want to contact me through brainkids at ucalgary.ca, feel free. We also have a Twitter feed and a Facebook page where we talk a lot about different mental health issues uh, for young people as well. There are cool things that come up, different events that are happening, and all that sort of stuff. Thank you very much. I'm very proud I ended exactly on an hour. So I have some questions from the web already. I have three. Uh, the first one is, how much damage is done to the brains of teenage girls that starve themselves in their early to late teens? Eating disorders is very, very serious for brain development. Uh, it's actually been a very difficult thing to study. Uh, one of the things that, that, that's really prevented a lot of people looking at it too closely was in trying to figure out what causes eating disorders. Well, there's so much damage to the brain from the lack of proper nutrition that it's really hard to distinguish one thing from the other. Uh, but, and that really hammers home the point that it's not something to take lightly. Uh, your brain, as you saw, you know, 20 percent of the oxygen that you take in a lot of the energy that your body burns through is through your old head, you know, is through your brain. Uh, it really is an energy hog, and if you are not getting enough energy to run your body, it's going to be adversely affected. If it's the developmental years, even more so, because you're building those connections, you're keeping those connections alive as well. And if your body's saying, no, you don't need that, no, we can't support that. No, we don't need that. You'll get rid of it. So it can be tremendously costly, and it's something that it, it should be taken very seriously. It's not just about the health of your kidneys or your liver, your heart, you know, the things that people usually start to think about, oh, well, you could damage your heart and, and, and die fairly easily, cardiac problems, that sort of stuff, with eating disorders. You really got to think what's going to do long term and how that's going to influence recovery. Uh, my second question is, how much attention deficit hyperactivity disorder medication, ADHD medication, um, affects the growth of the adolescent and then down the line adult brain? There's actually a really large study that came out in the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, uh, by this really great guy. Uh, uh, Castellanos is his last name. And he did a very huge developmental study on ADHD looking at the effect of medication on brain development and physical development. And what they found actually was there was no measurable effect that could be determined. And it's one of those things that kind of came out with some, there are a few anecdotes, you know, very early on and, and a couple of little blips on the radar and it turned into one of those persistent stories that really stuck. Uh, not just with the public, but also with a lot of healthcare providers as well. Uh, but the data on a large scale done very, very well, this is an extremely well done study, uh, hasn't really supported it. Uh, it does affect brain chemistry. Uh, that's its job. That's what it's supposed to do. Uh, but does it affect, you know, brain growth and then change things so far down the line that, you know, you have difficulty later on? Uh, no. There's not a lot of evidence to support that. And one of the interesting things with ADHD, to kind of put it into uh, context as well, is that 
There's a lot of interesting work by this guy, Philip Shaw, really lovely English guy, uh, who published uh, some very stellar work showing how the brain, develops, the brain develops in ADHD, especially the frontal lobe, like we're all talking about today, uh, and how in kids with ADHD, it lags behind about two to three years. Uh, but eventually, they get there. And so the medication helps support their behaviors and their cognitions so they can get to that point. Rather than letting the ADHD shape the brain, it allows kind of the normal brain function to occur and for those habits to start to try to be impressed upon it. Uh, it's really amazing data. You can actually look it up online. There's a little short video on it that's in 14 seconds, it'll change how you look at ADHD. It's very impressive stuff. And I will get you to email me the link to that video after this presentation, sure. and then I will send it out as a resource to everyone who registered to attend. Uh, I don't know if anyone has any questions in the room. If you do, please uh, raise your hand, and Wendy here in the room will provide you with a mic. In the meantime, I will ask question number three. Does increasing stress in children with mental health issues build their brain or harm it? It all depends. Again, the stable, supportive relationships. Uh, you know, one of the things that can happen is when mental illness really comes a, becomes apparent in a young person, there, there can be a tendency, like any other diseases and, and disorders, to try to insulate them from every possible thing that could ever happen in life. And, bubble wrap the heck out of them uh, to try to keep them safe. In reality, the thing to remember is they need those developmental experiences the same as every other kid. So you know, they, they need that sense of normalcy. The changing in how you support them, the depth of support you might have to offer might be quite different. You, know, you take someone who has a, a, a social phobia, for example, uh, just for them to physically walk into the high school dance, even if they don't dance or talk to anybody. That can be a big deal and a big achievement for them. You know, it's not necessarily asking out somebody to the prom or it, it could be what sort of increment still challenges them and allows them to grow that they can feel safe with and supported about. So it's, it, there it can be a real tendency to try to shelter the person as much as possible. And the instinct is right, but the execution needs that balance of you still need to be exposed, you still need to grow, you still need to learn how to manage and move. Uh, if you're in such a dire straits that you just can't handle anything, that's obviously quite a different story and that requires a lot of careful therapy and management to try to get out of that. Uh, but for more of the, the chronic conditions that go over long periods of time, you know, you still have to keep your eye on the prize of making sure someone's as fully functioning adult as they can be. So building on that question, and this is my own personal question, I was listening to a researcher on CBC Radio just over the weekend, and he was saying that because of how much our children are coddled these days, um, that brain development is actually slowing down so that our children don't actually have fully developed brains until later. They just don't have the same experiences that they would say, uh, okay, some of us in this room who may have grown up in the 70s and 80s, right, where you were thrown out of the house in the morning and you could come home in the, you know, before yep. it was dark. And we, um, we played in the streets and we rode our bikes and we went, we didn't have play dates, we just went and we played. And so that actually helped our brains develop and grow. Would you agree with that statement that children, adolescents, and teens today are taking a bit longer to, quote unquote, grow up, mature? The evidence is, a, is, is interesting on, uh, on a couple of fronts on that. Like, I mean, when I was a kid, my mom had the rule of the sun had to be above our neighbor's house before I could leave and go out and play. And, you know, we'd go off into the woods for miles. You know, imagine how far you could walk in four hours into the deep woods. And you're like 10. You have no compass, nothing. Um, you know, these days they'd be charged with neglect. Uh, you know, back then it was great. You know, we built fantastic log cabins, all sorts of wonderful stuff. And 
the, the, the big thing that has to happen as well is that there needs to be a certain level of socialization that occurs. One of the big things that's lacking now is what to us is normative socialization, uh, where you're sitting in a room talking to people uh, and all that sort of wonderful things that can happen. With kids, a lot of that has changed. There's a lot more internet and for a, a speech being webcast, this is kind of ironic, but there's a lot more interact, internet interactivity uh, that's going, that, that goes on where, you know, you could have kids that have friends scattered across Earth that they talk to on a regular basis, that they'll play video games with where one person's in one room in, you know, Edmonton and somebody's in another room in Saskatchewan, you know, or California. Uh, you know, those sorts of events can happen. There is a lot of concern, though, about the screen time and its effect on brain development. Uh, there's a lot of concern about video games and its effect on brain development. Is there a lot of evidence out there showing how bad it is? Not so much. It's pretty weak. It's only very early. Those kids haven't been around that long. Uh, but the big thing to remember with, say, video games, for example, is they're designed to manipulate your nucleus accumbens, that little thumbnail-sized part of your brain that I talked about earlier. They're designed to manipulate that like a virtuoso. That's why when you're playing the games, you have all these immediate rewards that come pretty quick. Oh, I'm going to keep playing Fruit Ninja. This is awesome. And then you get to the higher rewards, and they do what are called differential reinforcement schedules, where you have only so many wins for so many tries. and it's they exploit more behavioral science than most therapists do, to be quite honest. They really exploit it hard. And what that does to the developing brain, we don't know, because that generation is still coming of age, where you know, they've got basically unequivocal access. Like if I wanted to play Pong, you know, I'd have to set up all the or Atari, I'd have to set up the whole equipment, it would take me forever. If I want to go to the arcade, I'd have to get quarters and, you know, or save quarters, which is even worse, and then, you know, take my chances, but once the quarters ran out, I was done. Nowadays you have kids who have access to, you know, iPads, smartphones, laptops, all these sorts of things that are great educational resources that they can also stay on and play for hours and hours upon end. What that does to your developing relationship between your prefrontal cortex and your nucleus accumbens, we don't know. But it is one of the big questions that's out there. And we actually, when I was in uh, Michigan, one of the top questions we used to get in the Department of Child Psychiatry were questions about, well, my son will never, he won't stop playing video games. We think he's addicted to video games. And that was one of the top questions we used to get. And it's actually turning, there's a lot more science coming out of uh, South Korea on this, believe it or not, uh, where they've been looking at it much more seriously than we have, about what the, that screen time and the changing nature of that relationship between your reward center and your boss of the brain, how that's being changed uh, over time as well. So yeah, it is, it is having an effect. We don't quite know what it is yet. Is it something to be worried about? Yeah, unstructured play is a big deal. It's a big deal. And it makes me kind of sad that it's turned into kind of a hippie movement and not a common thing, you know. Uh, it, it's, it's a fringe element that isn't thinking about play dates. You know, I never had my mom phone ahead to my friends to say I was coming over. I would just go knock on the door. And if I was there too early, they'd say, go away. Why are you waking us up? You know, and that, what did I learn? Respect other people. Don't go bug them before they're awake. Uh, see, learning lesson right there. Uh, but those sorts of events, though, are now denied them. You know, you, you think of how much courage it takes to muster up to ask somebody out to be boyfriend, girlfriend, all that sort of fun stuff. Uh, if you haven't had the experience of just generally socially interacting with a lot of people, it makes it much, much harder much harder. You didn't have those little positive stresses to make you resilient, to train you for the big stresses later on. We really need to get together as parents and just break down the whole play date phenomena that's going on and just kick our kids out of the house again.
Well, it, it, exactly, and it's it's a lot of it came out of the fear of oh my god, my kid's going to get abducted. No, your kid's not that nice. Nobody wants them. Um, <laughs> the, statistically, actually, it's actually much rarer now than it was when we were kids, uh, and it's not nearly as common an occurrence. And those opportunities, it's that same thing. It's that piece of dirt getting to the clam, aggravating it, build that pearl up. It's that those experiences are what help change and allow you to grow. So I'm going to kind of amalgamate a couple of questions here. There's a lot of drug um, effect questions. So like, you know, if, um, if your child is on Tegretol for epilepsy or we already talked about ADHD medication, um, so I don't know if you can summarize what are the effects of these um, neurological changing medications on overall brain development or do they just help change the behavior not the actual growth of the brain and I apologize to anyone online if I've made a mess of your question well I, I'm gonna say something that's probably gonna scare the pants off a lot of people uh, is for a lot of these things they don't know plain and simple they don't know they haven't done the long-term studies uh, for a lot of, because one of the other things that happens a lot is a lot of kids get on what's called polypharmacy, where they're on multiple medications for a particular condition. So they'll, they'll be on like three different drugs. Uh, they really don't know what happens then. Uh, but the thing to remember is the job of these drugs is to change brain activity, what's going on in the brain from a neurochemical point of view. So there are brain effects. For things like a lot of the like Ritalin for ADHD, they've actually looked because there's enough parental oomph out there to actually do it, uh, to come out and say these things. For some of the antipsychotics, for example, uh, they do cause structural changes in the brain. Uh, there's some great work by uh, Machiri Keshavan, who's now at Harvard, who's shown some of this work. Uh, for some of the antidepressants, uh, there's some work in kids uh, done with my old colleague Dave Rosenberg uh, in, uh, at Wayne State University where they showed structural changes as well. So there are brain effects, don't get me wrong, and it's not like they're all uh, Pollyanna, wonderful, nothing's ever going to happen, that's bad. Um, it, you know, it's, there are risks, and it's one of those things of what can you do to help fight back and restore as much normal functioning as possible? Yes, there's cost benefits with that. Uh, and you know, that's why one of, for a lot of the parents with young people with depression, their first instinct is to think, mm, you know, it's not that bad. We'll forego medication. We'll see what we can do through counseling, through this, through that, through this, through that. Uh, as long as the parents are involved, connected, and attentive, and they're actually paying attention to changes in their kid. You know, that kind of proactivity is not such a bad thing, but there always is a cost-benefit ratio, and sometimes the evidence isn't there to answer the question. Does that mean that the absence of evidence is the evidence of absence? No, it means they don't know. Uh, and it's one of those great questions to always ask your doctor, harangue them, ask them all the time and say, you know, for this medication, what are the long-term effects? What are the things I need to think about? What are the things, are there any metabolite levels that we need to monitor? Are there any, you know, uh, are there any studies that show that this combination of treatments is effective? Sometimes they're gonna say no. Sometimes you're gonna be out on a limb. Sometimes there might not be another option. That's okay. And I believe this will be our last question for today's presentation. In your experience, how does fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, so those who have been diagnosed uh, or have maybe FAS, um, and drug use affect brain development? I don't know the, if the drug use is illegal drug use or prescription mm. drug use. So maybe we'll work on the pretense that it's uh, prescription drug use. Uh, for inter like for interventions for FASD, I don't know that much about it, so I'm going to uh, reserve comment on that. From a 
brain development point of view for FASD, I've been I've been involved with some some very keen work uh, that was being done by a colleague of mine, and it was some of the most terrifying MRI images I've ever seen. Uh, it can cause some fairly substantial changes in brain development that are extremely shocking. Uh, like naked eye, the average person can look at the scan and go, well, okay, that's not right. Uh, there's all sorts of even more subtle effects that can go down. Those would be the extreme cases. And there's subtle effects that can happen down the line as well. And you can think that they're being exposed to a pretty toxic environment, you know, in utero by that much alcohol uh, that they're swimming in, if you will. And that effect on brain development is pretty substantial. Uh, is it the end? Is there nothing you could do? Are they hardwired forever? No. Intervention-wise, you know, their brains are just as plastic as anybody else's. How far you can push it, we don't know. You've got to push it as far as you can. Are there other techniques that could be developed to help intervene? Uh, more rehabilitative approaches, things like that? Uh, you know, yeah, actually we were talking about some earlier today. There's new technologies that actually will stimulate directly different parts of the brain and help increase and improve their function. Uh, and th these aren't pills, these are, this is actual machinery, technology that you, can, that you can use that's safe, tolerable, all sorts of wonderful stuff like that. They're using it in things like pediatric stroke, cerebral palsy, uh, those kinds of conditions to do rehab on motor function. And now there's a whole group of people looking at how to do rehab on cognitive function for it as well. So there's all sorts of new opportunities down those lines. Uh, so from an exposure point of view, <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible thing. Uh, so it's something that, um, you know, people really need to work hard to make a good outcome happen or the best outcome possible happen. And I'm very proud of myself I did not fall off the stage. So thank you, Dr. McBaster, for um, sharing your insights into the teen brain and uh, especially the strong influence of reward uh, in the teen brain, but also the plasticity of the executive function and the possibilities, I guess, of the teenage brain. I think the questions were very uh, interesting as well. So thank you, everyone uh, in the web audience and the live audience uh, for joining us today. As we mentioned earlier, uh, follow-up evaluation and a link to today's presentation will be sent out to everyone who registered, and you will receive a certificate of attendance upon completing the evaluation of today's session. Uh, to watch uh, this session and uh, previous ones from the first year, uh, please do go and visit our Human Services uh, website under Children's Mental Health. And uh, think about joining us next month where we'll have Frank McMaster back again in Calgary on Tuesday, November 4th. And I believe the session will be about understanding adolescent men mental illness. Yep. So taking us into another chapter of uh, this topic. So thanks again and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. <laughs>